Today we're going to talk about the voice of the customer, how to understand customer needs for new product development. I'm Abby Griffin. I'm from the University of Utah, where I hold the Royal L. Garf Presidential Chair in Marketing. We're going to cover five topics in this seminar. First, we're going to define customer needs and the voice of the customer. We're going to talk about when customer needs should be gathered in the new product development process. And then I'm going to go over three separate techniques for gathering customer needs. Ethnography, customer visits, and the voice of the customer interview process itself. Customers understanding at firms have very different definitions of what needs and what problems are. And there are many different processes for uncovering needs. Most firms have processes that are more informal than formal. And it's unclear whose responsibility it is for gathering customer needs in many firms. So there are lots of different problems um, with gathering customer needs at firms. The result is that we understand some problems of some of the people at some important already satisfied customers. And we have an incomplete understanding of the totality of the customer needs for a particular functional area. Therefore, customers should be using a voice of the customer formal process to obtain a full and complete understanding of needs at, at their customers. And the process consists of three things. First, it's a set of processes for qualitatively obtaining an exhausted list of customer needs and wants, ordering them into a logical hierarchy from the most general and abstract at the top to the most detailed at the bottom, and finally, quantitatively assessing how important each of those needs are. So understanding customer needs is just the first part of a three-part voice of the customer total process. What makes a good customer voice? First, it's a complete set of wants and needs, not just a partial set. Where There are many, many details that, that need to be gathered. And so if you just understand that people want ease of use and convenience, you have come nowhere near gathering the, the voice of the customer. Second, these have to be expressed in the terms that customers use, not in company jargon. Companies speak in their own jargon, and customers sometimes won't understand that. They have to be organized in the way that people think about how they're organized, what's grouped together. Companies often end up thinking about the organization of customer needs based on how they develop a product, the different functional areas that are involved, rather than how a customer uses the process. And you need to organize them based on how the customer uses the process. Finally, they have to be prioritized by the customer. Not how we think as a company that they should be prioritized, but how the customers actually tell us that it is very important. So let me give you an example of, of of a product that has that is solving a problem. So if you think about this, this is a shoe. And what are the pro what does this product do? What are the problems that this product solves for a person? Well, first of all, it keeps your foot protected from the environment. It may keep your foot dry. It may look good and look fashionable. And even though this is a simple shoe, it actually does a whole lot for you. Now, this particular pair of shoes is important because it also allows you to pack the shoes into a very small space for people who are traveling. Now, this shoe and the problems that it solves is very different from this shoe and the problems that this one solves. So this shoe isn't particularly comfortable if I'm going to be standing in front of an audience for four or five or six hours. This shoe with a rubber sole is much more comfortable if I'm going to be standing in front of an audience or, or a class for four or five hours, particularly if the class is, the floor of the classroom is only a cement floor with very little covering on it. This shoe also is higher, and therefore it can keep me drier if you've got standing water around. These are all problems. The shoes solve those problems in different ways, um, but it's the problems that we're, we're interested in, in understanding, not the features of the, of the shoe itself. As a second example, here's an example of two products, one of which was a failure and the other of which was a success. The Apple Newton was an abject failure. It was conceptualized by the Advanced Technology Group out at Apple and approved by John Scully on an airplane ride back from New York City to San Francisco. Everything that was developed was based on technology-driven aspects. They thought that the, the advanced technology group thought that the ability to understand writing was a cool technology, and technology was the end in, a, in and of itself. For the Palm Pilot, technology was just a means to an end. 
they went about studying how people use paper, what different functions they did the most frequently, which was why in the, in the Palm Pilot there were four functional buttons. Those are the buttons that people use most frequently. Rather than using an automated handwriting capability, they developed a simplified alphabet called giraffe, which, people, which was intuitive and was easy for people to learn. They also did things like thought about how are people going to carry this kind of a device about? Well, men typically carry them in pockets, in their shirt pocket. And so they went about studying which shirt maker had the smallest pocket and then made sure that the design of that Palm Pilot would fit into any shirt pocket, including the, the smallest design pocket that was out there. Because the development team for the Palm Pilot was so attentive to all of the details of customer problems that this was going to solve, the Palm Pilot was a successful product in the marketplace. Whereas the Apple Newton, where, people, where, the, where the development team focused on the technology and the whizziness of the technology, ended up being an abject failure. All right, customers speak in a different language than we do. Customers will say, I want a powerful computer. And the engineers hear, oh, this is MIPS and gigahertz and RAM. These are the things I need to design in. Customers will say, I want a roomy front seat in this car. And the automobile designers think of, okay, how many inches of leg room and shoulder room does that mean? Customers will say, I want good on-time performance. And engineers talk about A plus 15 block times, which is how on-time performance is actually measured. And finally, we talk about hassle-free claims if you're thinking about insurance. And the insurance company thinks in terms of form length and days of processing. So because we fundamentally think in two different languages, it's important to understand what a good definition of a customer need is. Now, there's a bunch of engineering folklore out there that says that customers can't tell you what they want. They don't know it. They don't know what they want until they see it. And no customer would have ever said that they wanted a microwave oven, an iPod, TiVo, or a BlackBerry. As Henry Ford put it, if I'd asked customers what they wanted, they would have told me they wanted a faster horse. Now, in reality, customers can tell you what problems they have and what problems they want your company to solve. And they can speak in terms of very detailed information about, how, about what they would like to have solved. If a customer can tell you what the product should look like, hire that customer because they know better about the technology than your designers do. Your job as a technologist in a firm is to understand customer needs in sufficient depth that you can then bring those into the company and come up with a solution to those problems that the customers will want to purchase from your company. So a definition of a customer need is it's the benefits that the product or service features deliver to the consumer. It's the problems that customers would like to have solved. It's what the products are going to let you do. And sometimes we call these customer murmurs. The reason we call them customer murmurs is because people don't naturally speak in problems. They speak in features and solutions. And so our job is to learn how to make them talk in problems rather than features. And that when they do do that, the murmurs, the customer needs come out one little statement at a time, and then you have to build those individual murmurs up into the entire voice of the customer. So if you go about talking to customers about features, all you're going to be able to do is identify today's dominant product because that's what they're familiar with. They know about features of current products, but they can't tell you what the features are in the future that are going to solve their problems better. So it's only when you ask them about needs and when you understand what needs and problems are that you can lead to tomorrow's dominant product, and that's the goal of the corporation. What should I build a, be building for customers for tomorrow rather than today? So new product development professionals in particular need lots and lots of details because the devil and product development success is all in the details. They need problems or needs, and they need the specifics of those problems and needs. And they need lots of contextual information. What new product development professionals are trying to do is they're trying to make trade-offs across different features that could be incorporated into a product. And for that, they need the details 
so that they can come up with the right specifications and features. So what are the de definitions of a good customer need? I call this the four C's. First, they're in the customer's words, not the voice of the team, not the voice of management, but what customers actually say. Not the voice of the team, not the voice of the management, but what customers actually say. Every company has company jargon. You've got to be able to speak to the problems of the customers in the way that customers talk about them. They need to be clear. These are easily understandable by the team currently as well as over time across teams as team members change and we evolve the product team. That means that you don't want to use words like ease of use and convenient because convenient has many, many different definitions. You want to get down to the specific details. So if I think about, for example, what a computer monitor lets me do, a computer monitor lets me look at what I'm working on as I'm working on it. That's what it does. That's its base needs. That's a very clear statement. The third thing is you want it these statements to not be too wordy. Lots of customers speak in inelegant terms and you have to figure out, okay, he just said 15 words and what they really boil down to is something that's a bit more concise rather than lengthy. And finally, you wanna have customer needs be contextually rich and include all the context. So if I think about a laptop's monitor or laptop screen, I want to, it allows me to see what I'm working on as I'm working on it. Now, what's, what are the contexts that it has to solve that problem for? Well, I want to see what I'm working on when I'm at home in incandescent light. I want to be able to see what I'm working on when I'm at the office working in fluorescent light. I want to be able to see what I'm working on when I'm in an airplane with a crappy overhead light and it's at night. And I want to be able to see what I'm working on when it's daylight and I am up in an airplane at 35,000 feet and it's a beautiful sunny day with sun streaming in. Now, the reason you want to know about those contexts is because some technologies work better in bright light and some technologies work better in low light. You'd love to have a solution that really met, allowed me to work on what I'm working on and see what I'm working on in every kind of light source and light amount. But the problem is achieving that is very, very expensive. And it's too expensive for most laptops. And so because the team is making trade-offs in whether to go for a low light screen or a high light screen, they have to understand which of the contexts is gonna be seen the most by the group of people they are targeting with their product. Now there are several different categories of customer needs. One of them, of course, is called threshold needs. These are problems that need to be solved to a certain extent, but you don't have to, more is not always better. So if you think about a car, we expect to be kept safe if a car gets into an accident at 30 miles an hour. That's a threshold need. We really don't expect to be kept safe if the car gets into a crash at 75 or 85 miles an hour. So safety that you build into a car is a threshold need. Then there are performance needs. And those are needs where more is always better or less is always better. And those kinds of needs you can understand because they're evolutionary in nature. Those are things we readily know. But what you're really looking for in new product development is what's called excitement needs. These are problems that if they're solved, they create a lot of excitement. But if they're not solved, we didn't really expect them to be solved in the first place. But gee, now that we've got them available, these solutions available, now they really make us excited about the particular product that we're going to buy. One of those kinds of problems that were solved were cup holders in American cars. Before there were cup holders in American cars, typically people would put their drinks between their legs or balance it on a dashboard. Um, and, the, and Toyota came into the U.S. and observed how people were driving and drinking fluids in their cars and observed that they had this problem. Well, we didn't care. We didn't think about having a great solution to those problems, but when Toyota came in and introduced cup holders, it created a lot of excitement about their cars. Now, the thing about excitement needs is that they'll start off being excitement needs. If they're not there, we don't have a problem. If they are there, we're excited about that product. 
but eventually they become downgraded to performance needs. More is always better. When my husband and I went looking for an SUV eight years ago, there were eight and 10 cup holders in every SUV that we looked for. And so the excitement needs or solutions to excitement needs actually get downgraded to performance needs. And ultimately in this day and age, they're now a threshold need. We don't need eight or 10 cup holders and kind of the standard in cars has mostly become four. Um, we don't have more than about four drinkers in any particular car. So there are different techniques for probing for customer needs. Um, when you're talking about threshold needs, there are lots of different ways that you can get those customer complaints, warranty data, focus groups. But when you get to performance needs, then it's Salesforce reports, it's one-on-one -on -one interviews, focus groups, and customer visits. If you're looking for excitement needs, these things which, if you solve those problems, will create great excitement for your products, are much more very specific kinds of techniques that, that are required to be used. One-on-one -on -one interviews work, customer visits, lead users, and ethnography. And so I'm going to be talking about three of those different types of techniques for understanding customer needs. Ethnography, customer visits, and one-on-one -on -one interviews through the voice of the customer process. You'll notice that, that focus groups aren't in that set of techniques that are very good for uncovering excitement needs. And what we've discovered through research is one-on-one -on -one interviews generally work much better than focus groups. And these are the data in this graph that show those. We also know that you don't need 50 or 100 interviews in order to gather the entire voice of the customer. Somewhere between 15 and 25 is sufficient to do that. So these are the three techniques I'm going to talk about, ethnography, customer visits, and one-on-one -on -one interviews. Now, the next question is, where in the new product development process should you be gathering customer needs? This graphic shows a typical new product development process or a stage gate process. Most companies in the world have these formal processes that they've implemented to help them be more successful at repeatedly doing product development successfully. It turns out that where you need to gather customer needs is right up front in the ideation and in the preliminary investigation stages. If you aren't gathering needs until physical development, then you've gathered it too late. It's got to be done before you have a concept that has crystallized in the mind of the project team and been accepted by management. So let me talk about ethnography, customer visits, and interviews. In general, these are considered to be qualitative marketing research techniques. The objectives of these techniques are information richness, deep understanding by the teams. These are all what I call DIY, or do-it-yourself, new product development team techniques for understanding customer needs. And it's also their objective is to give you a breadth of understanding across the team or organization. Now, remember, these results, these words that you're getting through interviews and observations, are not statistically significant. You cannot gather importances or priorities using qualitative market research techniques. You have to use a different quantitative method after you've gathered the qualitative words of needs and, and wants. So qualitative research generally answers questions that begin with why, what influences, and how. You're going to be taught, you're going to be using open-ended questions, not closed-ended questions. And you're going to be trying to uncover the meaning and motives behind people's actions. Why do people do this? Why is that important? Those sorts of things. The first of these three techniques I'm going to talk about is what I call personal ethnography. And this is where you are the customer. So you're going to be your own customer and try and come up with an understanding of what customers need through being your own customer. And there are two examples I'm going to give. One is Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble does a lot of personal ethnography in their products. Um, they have a product which is called Always. It is a feminine hygiene pad. And all of the people on these feminine hygiene pad teams all use the products, both men and women. They will put them underneath an armpit uh, when they go running and exercise. This is to investigate how chafing occurs and how good the product is at, at absorbing odors uh, during exercise, not just the fluids. They wear them in, the, in their shoes 
um, for also figuring out how well the product captures odors and eliminates them. Um, and finally, they'll wear them in the anatomically appropriate places, testing out competitors' products as well as our products to get an internal, tacit understanding of how these products work and what are the pros and cons of the different designs that different manufacturers have out there. It's not just a process that can be used for business-to-consumer goods. This can also be used in the business-to-business -business arena. If your business sells to other firms, you can use this process as well. IBM uses this process with their point-of-sales systems. So if you go to a supermarket and you go check out at the supermarket, the grocery clerk is using a scanner system. And they scan the barcode on their system, a price rings up, um, and then they bag it for you. Now, there are several components to the point of sale systems. There's what the grocery store clerk does. But these systems also record inventory data and sales data for the entire store and are then help used in running the income statements for the store as well as the inventory statements that the store manager uses. So you've got the grocery clerks and you need to understand what their problems and needs are as well as you've got the store managers. And the store managers can't tell you about the grocery clerk's problems, and the grocery, clerk, grocery clerks can't tell you about the store manager's problems. So you have to understand both of those and develop a, an interview that will allow you to talk to both of those people or observe both of those people. So what P and G, sorry, what IBM does is IBM has every person in their point of sale system division, and that's about 400 people, run one checkout counter in a grocery store or a department store once a year for a full eight-hour shift that's starting up as a grocery clerk, running the entire day, and ending the day and checking out um, for their one of their systems as well as for one of their competitor systems every single year. They also have the people who are involved with developing the back-end software go in and once a, once a year pull down all of the kinds of reports that managers need to run the store better. So that allows them to know not just what the problems that the grocery clerks have, but also what the problems that the store managers have. And those are separate problems. They may be designed into the product by different parts of the overall development team, but you have to understand all of it. The way to be your own customers is you have to lead by example. It was the division president at IBM who said, I'm going to do this and everyone else in the division is going to do it as well. So if you don't have the top management saying, this is what we need to do, you may have a few people at lower levels of the organization who go out and actually do personal ethnography, but it's relatively inexpensive to do this. and so. It doesn't cost the firm a lot, a couple of days from all of their people, and yet the amount of information that's brought into the division, not just the development team, is phenomenal. You also have to develop a storytelling culture. I was on the board of Navistar International Truck and Engine a num for a number of years, and this company makes diesel engines and class 6, 7, and 8 trucks. Those are the big over-the-road semi-tractor trailer trucks. The company was developing the diesel engine for the Ford F-250, which is the mid-size pickup truck that Ford manufactures. Now, the board of directors were all rich people, other than me, and they pretty much drove high-end cars, Jaguars, Mercedes-Benz, all those kind of cars. Not one of them drove pickup trucks. And I was kind of appalled by this. and. Because of this, the firm gave me a Ford F-250 pickup truck with a prototype diesel engine. And I drove that prototype diesel engine for a year before it went into production and into the Ford truck. So I had a prototype engine. My job was to come back and to tell stories about it. Here's how I pump diesel. Here are the differences. Here's how difficult it is as a woman to pump diesel. The diesel handles are all messy, and here's, then diesel doesn't come off your hands. And so you have to develop a storytelling culture 
where then the managers of the company started to also drive pickup trucks with diesel engines in them so they could understand the problems that different kinds of target markets go through in in using their products. And finally, you have to look for creative and cheap opportunities. I was on the technology advisory board for Johnson Controls for a number of years. And Johnson Controls, this particular division, makes seating systems. And every time I would come to a board meeting, I would rent a car in Detroit and drive to a couple of hours to where their facilities were. And I would get into the facility and the design engineers would grab my car keys and would then drive the car I was driving for the next several hours. What they were doing was they were getting cheap access to competitors' designs for seating systems. And over the period of the day, they'd already paid for the car rental because they'd paid for me to come visit them. Then they would drive it on all kinds of different roads and see how their body felt um, at the end of the day. So being your own customers doesn't take a lot of money. It just takes a little creativity and a little support from the top. And it's amazing how much information your development team can get from doing it. So the kind of information you get from doing this is tacit knowledge and other firms' design trade-offs. But this tacit knowledge, this, this information that's difficult for people to articulate, is probably the most invaluable part of this. Now, there are a couple of keys to success. One is it helps if you've got a bit of personnel stability because then they will be working in the same area. If you're a company that transfers your people from function to function to product area to product area to product area, this technique won't be as valuable to you. Um, you need, need to also learn how to codify that knowledge. How do you take it from what you know to statements of wants and needs? You need to figure out how to get information access across the entire team. And you have to remember not to limit to the research to yourselves. Because you as a product development team member are going to be much more well-educated typically than the typical consumer. You're going to be different in your training. You're going to have more knowledge, more technical capability. So don't just limit the market research you do to yourselves. Make sure you include all kinds of other people. So that was personal ethnography. Let's talk about regular ethnography or how you critically observe customers. Now, notice I say critically observe. There are lots of people who see things and don't really observe. When my son was growing up, it was amazing how many times he could walk by a full garbage can and not notice that it was full and needed to be taken out. Now, the same is true of, of most people. They see things, but they don't observe things. So you need to make sure that you're not just seeing, but you're critically observing and kind of asking yourself, why are they doing what they're doing? You want to capture what they do for others to review and figure out why they were doing what they were doing. So let me give you a couple of examples. Black & Decker wanted to figure out how to make their power tools. They make lots of consumer power tools. And they wanted to figure out how can they make their equipment more efficient, so more power sipping rather than power using. So they went out and they spent time in the Amish communities in America. Now the Amish are what we call plain people. They don't use electricity, they don't drive cars, they have the horse and buggies, they dress in a very plain manner, but they make fabulous furniture. And they do it without electricity. So they thought, huh, in order to figure out how we can perhaps conserve and make more efficient power tools, Let's go out and observe what these Amish people do who make really gorgeous furniture but do it without power tools. And they learned a lot and came up with a next generation set of power tools that were much more, it was a step function, more efficient than the previous generation. Now, McDonald's also has people doing ethnography in their kitchens. For example, people who produce the gas kitchen equipment for McDonald's um, have their own test kitchens, and of course they have their engineers use the gas equipment in their own test, test kitchens. However, having someone who's an engineer who is trained in problem solving using a piece of equipment in a test kitchen is much different than seeing how a group of adolescents, high schoolers, may use that equipment in the back of a McDonald's 
For example, on a Friday night, just after a football game gets out and you've got hordes of students in the front of the house who want hamburgers, and you've got the whole back of the house, the kitchen being run by hordes of students as well, who aren't trained in technologies in technology, who aren't trained in solving technology problems. And so what the kitchen equipment manufacturers do is they will put multiple cameras, video cameras, in the corners of a McDonald's test kitchen and watch how the youngsters actually interact with and work with the equipment. They can get this from multiple angles, they can put the cameras up in the corners so that no one has to see or understand that they are being videotaped or filmed. Bring the films back and then you can see how, th how the equipment actually operates in a kitchen. The second technique I want to talk about is ethnography with post hoc interviews. So you're going to critically observe someone, but then afterwards you're also going to interview them about why they did what they did. So you're going to find someone who's solving a problem using your current solution, someone else's current solution, or a solution that they made. And the kludgier or more inelegant that solution is, the better. You're going to watch what they do, critically observe them, kind of trail around after them, and then capture what they do for others to review. Videotaping is really very good for this. And then ask them why they did what they did. So let me talk about customer visits and give you a couple of examples. My most favorite example of a brilliant customer visit is Nike and the outdoor basketball shoe. Converse is the maker of a canvas-topped basketball shoe. Nike, of course, is very successful in making basketball shoes. They have the share, they are the share leader in the world in making basketball shoes. And they have the people who make and design basketball shoes all are basketball players, not NBA players, but they are product product developers who also love basketball. And so they use the company's shoes routinely, but they couldn't figure out why they couldn't break into Converse's market. Why was Converse still so successful? They had a strong niche, and nothing Nike could do could ever decrease the share of market that Converse had. One day, one of the product developers realized, as they were playing basketball at lunch, that they were playing indoors on a wooden court with no rain and no gravel. It was a very clean court with good lighting. And he had this aha in that they were designing for themselves, but not necessarily for the target market for Converse. So they did a little digging, and they discovered that the target market for Converse are predominantly inner city people who are playing what's called street ball. This is pickup games in the inner cities typically and where you've got people coming and going over the course of a day. And so they'll pick up a team, play for a couple of hours, go off to their job or whatever else they're doing, someone else will come in, and the game has ro people rotating through it all day long. So they did something very creative. They put together two vans full of their shoes and all of their competitors' shoes. And they sent one to the inner city of L.A. And they sent one van to the inner city of New York City. And each van had about six guys with it who were basketball players and product designers for basketball shoes. They threw open the doors after they found a very active set of basketball courts with a lot of people playing pickup ball and said, hey, anybody want some free shoes? And once they got the cops cleared out and told them, no, 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 these aren't stolen shoes, We're all, we are legitimate, um, they started giving away shoes. And their only request was that after someone was done playing that they agree to be interviewed by the product development team of Nike and talk about what they felt, how they were, how they were wearing the shoes, what worked and what didn't work. Well, interestingly enough, what they discovered out of this process is that the teams that they were working with up at Nike played in these wonderful facilities and had good socks. So they all had socks that were pretty clean and they didn't have holes in them and they all had pretty good foot hygiene. But what they discovered about people who play basketball in the inner city is they have terrible foot hygiene. Their feet aren't clean, the socks are ratty, the socks are dirty, they're all crusty. And 
it's ugly. It turns out that the canvas top of Converse is a much more forgiving material than the high-tech sneakers that are used in playing on wooden basketball courts by people who are mid-class and, and upper-class. And that it was this forgivingness of the canvas top that really made, that really gave these basketball players the ability to play basketball with really atrocious socks and foot hygiene without getting blisters and without wrecking their feet. Whereas if they played in the high tech shoes, they really needed much better socks. So Nike looked at it and thought about it and looked at the brand equity that Converse had and the reputation. They could have made a canvas topped sneaker, but they decided that the better part, the better strategy was to just actually buy Converse and acquire the brand equity as well as the sneakers. And so that's what they did. Another example that's one of my favorites is the Ram truck. Now, Ram is a brand of Chrysler, and they make pickup trucks. Their major competitors are GM and Ford. A number of years ago, Ram's share had been declining, and they were just about at break even. And upper management had to figure out whether or not they wanted to eliminate this truck or totally redo the truck. And so they decided from a strategic perspective, they needed to be in the pickup truck area. Now they have lots of lines of cars as well, but pickup trucks were integral to their brand image and to their brand needs. And so they went about trying to uncover customer needs. One of the things they did was they had pickup truck drivers, current pickup truck drivers of their trucks, of Fords, of GMs, bring their trucks in and they looked over the interior of the, interview, of the trucks. And one of the things they discovered was that a number of them had these, these, these construction things with a big, huge hole, very big, in it. And they looked at them and asked the drivers, what is this? Now, many of these men who drive pickup trucks work in the construction industry, and so they're able to make their own solutions to things. What they told them was, yeah, 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 the truck had a cup holder, but the cup holder only was designed to hold a little 12-ounce bottle of soda or bottle of water or whatever. But guys who work construction and drive pickup trucks typically drink what's called a big gulp, which is about a 32 ounce or one quart um, drink, which has a circumference of the bottom of the glass of about like this. And so what they had done, because they didn't want to balance this drink between their legs, was they had constructed themselves their own solution. Well, the next generation of Ram pickup trucks had cup holders that accommodated these 32 ounce big gulps rather than just the 12 ounce little cans of soda. But they would not have seen this if they hadn't had them bring in their trucks and basically did a customer visit, but did a customer visit by having the products come to them rather than go to the products. So what do you get from this? One of the things, one of the types of information you get from customer site visits is process and workflow related knowledge. And this is particularly important when you're talking about businesses that sell to other businesses. You need to understand how your product is going to fit into that firm's workflow. It's got to be compatible with the other systems and processes that that firm is using. Some keys to success are you've got to observe critically, not just watch. You have to be in the field long enough to see both normal operation as long as abnormal operation. So you want to see when things go right and you want to see when things go wrong. So if you think about the Nike experience, they needed to be in each city for a week because they needed to have different types of weather that they were watching people play basketball in. They needed to get them playing during rain to see how these products perform during rain. And so you have to be in the field longer than just a few hours or a few days. Um, you still have to be able to translate actions and observations into words, and you have to be able to help the customers speak to you and translate their actions into words of problems and wants. And finally, you have to figure out how to get information access across teams. 
codicils, things to be wary of. You need to have a breadth of consumer types. And, and this can be a fairly slow process. It's going to take time and money, as does ethnography. And you don't always have the time and money to do ethnography or customer visits. And so that's why we use voice of the customer interviews. Now, voice of the customer interviews are one-on-one -on -one interviews, but we're going to talk to customers somewhat differently than is typical for firms in the past. So customers can't tell you that with which they're not familiar, but they can tell you about product excellences and shortcomings in various different contexts. So we're going to have situational in-depth interviews that lead people through their problems. We're going to use very specific questions to elicit specific details. We don't want generalities. Remember, because we're doing product development, we need all of the details. And for us, why is as important as what. So we're going to keep asking them why. Why do you do this? How do you, why did you do that? So keys to the voice of the customer technique are specific questions to elicit specific details. We're going to actually question indirectly rather than directly. So we're not going to say what problem do you want solved. But we're going to have them talk about actual experiences. And we're going to have them talk about these experiences in great depth to uncover reality. Because people will talk to you about things they haven't experienced, but they're really talking about fantasy. And so if you ask someone a question about something they've never done, they'll try and answer because they want to be helpful. But the validity of that answer is likely to be very low. All right? And continually asking these why questions gets below solutions to understand the problems. What to ask? We're going to lead them through functional needs for typical situations. What do I mean by functional needs? If you're thinking about a product that will allow you to store food until you want to eat it, that allows you to transport food that you're going to take somewhere else and then store it until you want to eat it, that's a functional need. I could have asked about a picnic basket, which is one solution. But if you ask about functional capabilities, what you get are people conceptualizing and thinking about all kinds of, of different solutions to that product. Not just a picnic basket, but a cooler or even a backpack or some other specialized product that will also solve that problem. You're going to try and lead consumers through functional needs for all edges of the performance envelope. So think about the last time you took um, food that you had prepared at home on a boat or to the beach or on a winter camping trip. You've got different, the performance envelopes that are different are the temperature of the food as well as the temperature of the environment that you're trying to do, how much mobility you have, um, whether or not you the ability to uh, how much you're going to be taking, all kinds of different functional pro performance parameters. And then you're going to probe continually for needs, problem they want solved, not features. Typically, a customer will tell you, well, I took a picnic basket. OK, a picnic basket is a solution. Why did they take the picnic basket? That will get you at uncovering the problems that that picnic basket solved. Okay, so the main differences between voice of the customer and other inquiry methods are we're going to talk about reality, not fantasy, because if they've never experienced something, they'll answer your questions because they want to be helpful, but it won't be reality. We're going to use indirect questioning. Tell me about the last time you carried food from here to there. We're going to have a functional orientation, not a product orientation. We're going to have multiple situations to gather all the breadth and depth of the details that you need across multiple different performance dimensions. And basically, you're going to have a conversation about what they did and why they did it. And buried in those conversations with consumers are the nuggets of information that detail their needs, all the set of problems that they want to have solved. Now, in-depth interviews have some advantages and they have some disadvantages. The advantages are that you can get 30 to 60 minutes of detailed knowledge with each person that you interview. And this is one of the reasons why focus groups aren't as good. A focus group may be two hours, but there are eight or 10 people. So on average, you get 10 to 15 minutes of information from each person. And that'll get you the general high level stuff, but it doesn't get you the depth of information that you need. So you've got more data that's generated per respondent. And for business-to-business -business firms, it's easier to schedule interviews with people than it is focus groups. Frequently, you can't bring competitors into the same room to do a focus group. 
So you need to talk to them one-on-one -on -one and individually anyway. Now, the disadvantages of one-on-one -on -one interviews is if you've got people who are watching from behind the mirror, listening to a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews can be very, very boring. It also may be more time consuming than focus groups, and it's more work for the interviewer because you're trying to get at the depth. And there's more analysis time that's required, but overall, we find that the advantages of using one on one interviews rather than doing focus groups um, far outweigh the disadvantages. So, when you're doing a voice of the customer interview, there are really four, four parts to it. The first is the contexts or the specific situations within which you're going to inquire. So if we think back to our food, transporting, and storage device, the picnic basket, cooler, backpack, whatever, the context that we're going to inquire about are the last time you took food on a car trip, the last time you took food to the beach, perhaps the last time you took food to a sporting event, like a cricket game. You're going to have an opener. What's the question that gets the story started? And typically, I find it's most useful if you start off with, tell me about the last time you, and then you talk about the functional orientation. You're going to have specific probing questions that help elicit the story for that particular piece of market research you're doing. And then you're going to have a series of generic probing questions. This is basically a set of questions that will allow you to ask why, rather than without sounding like a three-year-old going, why, 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 why? And so there are a number of different ways you can phrase those. What you get with interviewing customers for needs is lots of details and lots of contextual information and a breadth of information very, very quickly. Keys to success are you need to probe for the needs, not features, not solutions to the problems. And it is a process that product development teams themselves can use. You don't have to hire a market research firm to do any one of these four methodologies what I call DIY, or do-it-yourself customer need understanding. Now, it's going to be difficult if all you do is interviewing, and you may need to do interviewing because of the speed with which you need to get your product development project done, but it's going to be difficult to develop, to obtain tacit process and workflow information just by using interviewing. So basically, overall, what you want to do is you want to combine these methods some of which will give you tacit information, some are better at workflow process information, and some of which are better at giving you all kinds of details. Final words about obtaining customer needs and understanding them is that this isn't rocket science, but it is a different way of asking questions than typically have, have been used by firms before. You don't need experts to do it. The team can do it themselves. And what you want to do is find out people who have extensive breadth of experiences as well as novices. Novices will have one particular viewpoint and one set of capabilities. Experts will have a different set of capabilities. If all you do is go to the experts, you won't understand the problems of the novices. I hope you find this helpful. Have a great last couple of years of your school.